This is chapter six, ionic and molecular compounds. And in section three, we're gonna continue learning about naming and writing formulas for ionic compounds. So when naming an ionic compound, just like in the formula, the metal goes first. The name of the metal is written first, and because the name of the metal ion is the same as the metal itself, we just write the name of the element. That's the first part of the name of an ionic compound. The second part of the name of the ionic compound is the name of the anion, which is the nonmetal with the ending changed to IDE. Okay. You put a space between the name of the metal and the name of the nonmetal, and that is the name for the compound. So essentially, all you're doing is naming the two ions metal first, nonmetal second. Here's a table showing some examples of this. The formulas are here on the left-hand side. So we have Ki, K is potassium, and I is iodine. Potassium stays the potassium ion. Iodine becomes iodide. Okay. And so we get the name of this compound, which is potassium iodide. For this one, we have MgBr2, that's magnesium, and two bromines, or in, the, in this case, they're actually bromides because it's ionic. Uh, so the magnesium goes first, magnesium, and then bromide is second, magnesium bromide. In the last example, you have Al2O3. Al is aluminum. That's the name of the ion, just like it's the name of the metal. And O is the element oxygen, which becomes oxide when it's an anion. So here we have aluminum oxide. One thing to notice about these names is that none of them included any reference to the numbers in the chemical formula. Okay? The idea here is that just by naming these ions, you can figure out the formula by assuming charge neutrality. Okay? You know the charge in each of these ions mentioned here based on their position on the periodic table, and doing some simple arithmetic, you can figure out how many of each ion in the name you need in order to achieve a neutral compound. So let's do another example. Okay, here we have the chemical formula K2O. So name the ionic compound K2O. First of all, you need to be able to identify the ions involved, and part of that means identifying the elements. So K is the symbol for potassium. Okay. O is the symbol for oxygen. In this case, we have two potassiums for every oxygen. If you look up potassium on the periodic table, you'll see that it's in group one or one A, which means that it has a plus one charge, K plus. If you look up oxygen in the periodic table, you'll see that it's in group six A or 16. It has six valence electrons. To get to eight, it'll need two more electrons. And so that's gonna give it a two minus charge. And so oxide is O2 minus. So these are the ions involved in this compound. What are their names? Well, it's very simple. K plus is potassium because the name of the ion is the same as the name of the metal. Oxygen, when it becomes an anion, you change the ending to IDE. So oxygen becomes oxide. So you just put them together and K2O is the compound known as potassium oxide. Metal first, non-metal second. Here are three more examples of ionic compounds. And when you're naming a compound, the first thing you want to do is check on whether it's ionic or covalent. Okay? We haven't gotten to covalent yet, so you can assume that these are ionic, but the check that you want to do is to look at the first element written in the formula. If the first element is a metal, like it is for all of these compounds, then you're definitely dealing with an ionic compound. Okay? So let's go through each of these step by step. The first step is to identify the cation and the anion in the formula. So remember, the cation is always written first, and the anion is always written second. So in CaO, the first element is the metal, calcium, and that's going to be your cation. The second element is oxygen, and that's going to be the anion, the nonmetal. In Al2O3, the first element is Al, which is aluminum, that's going to be your metal cation. 
And the second element is again oxygen, which is going to be the nonmetal anion. In MgCl2, the first element, which is the metal cation, is Mg for magnesium. The nonmetal anion is the second element, and in this case, it's going to be from chlorine. Now we can go ahead and name the cation just by giving it the same name as the element it's from. So in this case, calcium, Ca2 plus, is just called calcium. Aluminum, Al3 plus, is just the aluminum ion. And magnesium, Mg2 plus, is the magnesium ion. Okay. Now again, this shows you the charges for these three ions, but this is not strictly necessary to know to answer this question. We'll see some examples later on for transition elements where you do need to know the charges in order to name it, but for any uh, compound that's formed only from main group elements, from the representative elements, you don't even need to know the charge. All you need to know is the name of the ion. The anion is just a little harder. This time you take the first syllable of the element name and you change the ending to IDE. So oxygen which is O2 minus becomes oxide, right? Same thing for the second one, for B, it's still oxide, still the same ion. And for C, it's a little bit different. We have Cl minus, which is the chloride ion. And again, you don't really need to know these charges. It's, it's useful for you to double check and make sure that you're, you're understanding this at this point, um, but you don't need to know those charges to, just to give it the name. You know that oxygen forms the oxide ion and chlorine forms the chloride ion. And that's all you really need. Now that you have the names of both the cation and the anion, you just put them together. Okay? So CaO is calcium oxide. Al2O3 is aluminum oxide. MgCl2 is magnesium chloride. And these are the names. Very simply, you're just naming the ions in the formula. Again, no reference to the charges, no reference to the number of particles in the formula or any of that. Just name the two ions. In this chart, we can look at how different ions combine together in different ways. So for instance, here we have sodium in the first row and aluminum in the second row. And so each column shows us a different anion that those two cations can bond to. So in this first box in the upper left, we have sodium combining with bromine, or in this case, really it's bromide because it's the ion. So sodium is plus one and bromide is minus one, so you really only need one of each in order to balance this to get charge neutrality. So the formula for sodium bromide is NaBr. And I just said the name of it without even really thinking too much about it because it's just the name of the metal or the cation followed by the name of the anion. In this case, bromine becomes bromide. We can do something similar for sodium and sulfur coming together. Okay? Sodium is a plus one charge Sulfur is a minus two charge. So in order for these to balance, we actually need two sodium ions for every sulfide ion, okay? And so together, these form the formula Na2S, right? We have two sulfur, I'm sorry, we have two sodiums, and so the two follows the Na for sodium, okay? The S is for sulfur. And again, this is very easy to name, we just name the metal cation, sodium again, and this, this time the anion is sulfide. Sulfur becomes sulfide. Sodium and nitrogen is very similar, right? This time we need three sodiums in order to balance the nitride or N3 minus ion. And so we end up with Na3N as our formula. And again, the metal ion, the cation is sodium, and this time I already said the name of the anion, nitrogen becomes nitride. In the lower row, we have these same anions, but now they're bonding to aluminum, okay? So for the first one, we have Al3 plus and bromine minus. We have more positive than negative, so we need more negatives, right? In fact, we need for every one aluminum, three bromines. That will give us a minus three charge and a plus three charge for charge neutrality. The name is the name of the metal, aluminum, followed by the name of the 
anion, bromide. Al3 plus and S2 minus, aluminum and sulfur ions coming together. Well, we can do that shortcut, right, where you take the superscript, the charge of the nonmetal, and you put it as the subscript for the metal, and the charge of the metal, and you put it as the subscript for the nonmetal. And we would just want to do a little math in our heads to make sure that this works out. First of all, we can see that this is a lowest whole number ratio. This, this ratio of 2 to 3 can't be reduced any further. Uh, and also, we just want to double check the charge, right? Two aluminum ions means 2 times plus 3, which is plus 6. And three sulfur ions means 3 times minus 2, which is minus 6. Okay? So the positive charge from the aluminum balances the negative charge from the sulfur. And so this is the correct formula, Al2S3. The name is much easier, aluminum sulfide. And then last but not least, we have aluminum and nitrogen coming together. And in this case, aluminum has a plus 3 and nitrogen has a minus 3. So you really only need one of each. right? One aluminum is plus 3, one nitrogen is minus 3. That balances out to 0. right? So that's pretty simple. And then the name is also simple. It's aluminum nitride. Now I said that when we're writing the names of these ionic compounds, we don't really need to make any reference to the number of ions in the formula or usually to the charge. Uh, and that is true for the ions that we've been looking at so far. But unfortunately, there are other ions in the periodic table that we've ignored until now. Those are the transition metals. Okay? So for all of the other ions that we've dealt with before now, those are considered representative elements or main group elements. Uh, those are in the first two groups or the last six groups. And those ions, you can always tell the charge on them uh, based on their group number. Okay? There's never any question about what the charge is on a sodium ion, for example. It's always sodium plus one because it only has a single valence electron. And so for that reason, if you just write the names of those ions in the, in the name of the compound, you can always figure out the balance between the positive and the negative and how many positive ions you need for the number of negative ions. But there is this class of metals that have variable charges that can form multiple different charge species, charged ions. These are the transition metals and then there's also a couple of others that are considered post-transition metals. They're further down in the periodic table and after the d-block transition metals. So now we're going to deal with that, and in order to deal with that, since they have a variable charge, the easiest thing to do is to indicate in the name which charge it is we're dealing with. Okay? Once you know that charge, then you can go through the same process of figuring out charge neutrality to discover the formula for the name that you're talking about, or vice versa if you're going the other way. Okay? Notice again, this is also not a problem for nonmetals. For the nonmetals, you can always tell the charge based on their position in the periodic table, which is very, very handy because we'll see that if you're given the formula or the name of an ionic compound, you can always look at the negative ion and know for sure what its charge is. And oftentimes that will help you figure out the charge on the cation. So just to get into this, the transition metals include metals like copper, iron, Lead is one of the, those post-transition metals, uh, chromium, others include zinc, vanadium, there's all sorts of uh, metals in that d-block. Okay? And these are examples of how you can write the ion with different charges. So Cu is the symbol for copper, but Cu can form two plus ions or one plus ions. And so in order to indicate that charge, we just write the charge number in Roman numerals in parentheses after the name of the ion. Okay? So we still have the name copper, and then in parentheses we have the Roman numeral two, which is just capital I, capital I. Right? That's how Roman numerals work. And the two indicates the charge on the ion. So for copper one plus, you just have the Roman numeral one in parentheses. For iron two plus, Fe is the symbol for iron. So for iron 2 plus, you have the Roman numeral 2. For iron 3 plus, you have the Roman numeral 3. Okay? 
and so on. You have lead 2 plus is Roman numeral 2, lead 4 plus is Roman numeral 4, chromium 2 plus is Roman numeral 2, chromium 3 plus is Roman numeral 3. Right? So just remember, the Roman numeral is equal to the ion charge. It is always exactly the ion charge. And it's for the positive ion. This only applies to transition metals. Right? And they're always going to form positive ions. Here we can see a sort of abbreviated version of the periodic table with the most common uh, transition elements that we're going to deal with in this course. Now, most of these other ones in this area still have this issue where they can form multiple different uh, ions, but they're less common elements. We're just not really going to deal with them that much in this course. Okay, So it's these elements here that we're interested in. Okay? There's no need to remember this table, though. Okay, you don't need to memorize lists of what kinds of charges every transition metal you can get. It's, it's unnecessary. We're going to see how you can figure it out from either the formula or from the name. Okay? And then, so this is the D block, or is transition metals. But then again, I said there's also those post-transition metals, which come just after the D block, and that's over here. These, this is SN, which is tin, and PB, which is lead. Okay, tin and lead. And so those both have variable charges as well, and so we treat them like transition metals. Okay, they have the Roman numeral, etc. So how do we determine the charge on an ion if the ion can take on multiple charges? Okay, well, from the formula, remember that I said the negative ion, the anion, always has a charge based on its position on the periodic table. So we can virtually always use the charge on the anion to figure out the charge on the cation if we know the formula. Okay? So we just have to be able to locate the anion, the nonmetal on the periodic table, figure out its charge, and then using charge neutrality, relate that to the cation charge. So in this case, we have MnF2. Mn is the symbol for manganese. F is the symbol for fluorine. Fluorine is in group seven. It has seven valence electrons, and so it likes to gain one more electron to become F minus. That's the fluoride ion. Okay. So fluoride has a minus one charge. But then you have to look at the formula and ask how many fluorides are in this. Okay. And in fact, there are two fluorides, two ions of fluorine for every manganese ion. So that means the total negative charge is two times the fluoride charge. Two times negative one gives you a minus two charge for the negative side. We still don't know what the positive side is, right? We still don't know what this manganese charge is. That's what we're solving for. But we do know that it has to balance the negative charge to equal zero. Okay? So the manganese charge, whatever positive number the manganese charge is, minus two equals zero. Well, what minus two equals zero? The answer is obviously two. So the charge on manganese in this compound, in this particular compound, is manganese two plus. Okay, you have a manganese two plus ion and you have two fluoride ions. This is the charge balanced, a single manganese two plus and two fluorides with minus one charge each. That gives you charge balance. So just from knowing the fluoride charge, we are able to figure out that manganese has a two plus charge. And so when we want to write the, the name for this, we write the two plus charge as a Roman numeral in parentheses right after the name of the metal. So this is pronounced or this is spoken as manganese two fluoride. Let's do another example. Right. To analyze the problem, you look at the formula. If you need the name from the formula, you have to figure out the cation and the anion. In this case, the cation is a variable charge transition element. And so we need to use the charge from the nonmetal to figure out the charge on the metal to give it the appropriate name. Right? We're going to consider that Roman numeral part of the ion name. So in this case, we have a nonmetal of chlorine, or chloride is the ion, and there are, once again, two of them, two chlorides. Okay? Chloride is in group 7, or 7A, excuse me, 7A or 17 in the new system, I should say. 
uh, and so it's going to have a minus one charge. If you have two chlorides and they each have a minus one, that gives you a minus two contribution from the negative side. In order to balance that, the positive ion has to be plus two. Okay? We can solve this little equation down here. But simply in your head, you can say the negative two charge from the chlorides has to be balanced by a plus two by the metal. And since there's only one metal ion, by itself it has to provide the two plus charge. If there were more than one metal ion, you would distribute or divide that positive charge amongst all of them. But in this case, that's the only source of positive charge, and so that's where the whole two plus has to come from. Okay? So you have a single iron two plus, and really you have two Cl minuses, two chloride ions. Now that we know the charges on the transition metal, we can just say the name, okay? Fe is iron, and the charge is two plus, and so we call this iron two, right? Again, this Roman numeral two is tacked on, and it's really considered part of the name of the ion. Iron two is a different ion from iron three, okay? They have a different charge. And so we can name the anion as usual, by changing the ending to IDE, and so chlorine becomes chloride, and so the name is just iron two chloride. Okay? You need the Roman numeral here to indicate which iron ion you're talking about. Here we can see a sort of uh, abbreviated periodic table with just some of the ions that we've been dealing with until now. And so we can see that you have the main group elements here in the first two columns, and in these last six columns, other than these post-transition metals down here, which really belong more to the transition metals, but other than those, these main group elements have only a single possible charge. And so you can tell the charge directly from their position on the periodic table. There's never any question, never any ambiguity about it, and so you don't ever need to indicate the charge with a Roman numeral for any of these elements. It's only for these transition metals here in the center right, in this D block, that you need to worry about the Roman numerals to indicate the charge, because there may be a variable charge. Even there are a couple that don't necessarily have multiple charges, so silver, cadmium, and zinc tend to only form one type of ion, but because they're in the transition elements, we still uh, write them with the Roman numeral to indicate their charge, okay, just, we just keep them as part of that. And also these post-transition metals down here are, again, sort of honorary transition metals. So we write Roman numerals for those because they have a variable charge. Okay. So how will we name this compound? We have the ionic compound formula, which is SnO2. Okay. So Sn is tin. O is oxygen. Okay, so we should start by knowing what elements are in the formula. Okay? And then we have to think about the charges on these, right? Well, we know tin is a metal, and so this must be an ionic compound. If it's an ionic compound, then we want to name it using the names of the different ions. Okay? If tin were a regular main group element, we could just call it tin oxide. But it's not. Okay? Tin is in the main group, but it's one of those post-transition metals that... Uh, needs the Roman numeral because tin can take on multiple different charge states. So in order to figure out which particular ion of tin we're talking about, we have to look at oxygen and we have to know what the charge on oxygen is. Okay? Oxygen is in group 6A. That means it has six valence electrons. If it has six valence electrons and it wants two more to achieve an octet, then it's going to end up with a minus two charge. O2 minus is oxide. So you have to be able to figure out the charge on the nonmetal from its position on the periodic table. That is essential for answering a question like this. Once you know the charge on it, the next thing you want to look at is how many of them there are, right? And so we actually have two oxides. Okay? Two oxides, each with a minus two charge, gives you a total negative charge of minus four. In order for SnO2 to be neutral, this minus 4 has to be balanced by a plus 4 on the metal side. Right? But the metal 
is really just a tin ion. There's no subscript here, which means it's just a single tin ion. There's, there's not two or three tin ions, just one. So if you need a plus four charge, it's all got to be from this one tin ion. And so really you're dealing with SN4+. Plus. That means the name of this specific tin ion is tin Roman numeral four, which is capital I, capital V. So the name of this compound is the name of the metal ion, which is tin four in Roman numerals in parentheses, and then a space, and then the name of the anion, which is oxide. So this is the name of SNO2. Here we can see it written out step by step. Right? One tin, two oxygens, oxygens in group 6A, that gives it a minus two charge. That means the contribution from the negative side is minus four, balanced against this charge here that we're unsure of, which is X. Turns out that X equals plus four, tin plus four. That makes it tin four with the Roman numeral, oxygen is oxide, and so again, our answer is tin four oxide. On the other hand, we might sometimes know the name of an ionic compound, and we might want to write the formula based on the name. So in an ionic compound, it's always named from the two ions that make it up. You have the cation named first, and the anion named second. Okay? If there's more than one possible charge for the cation, which is uh, the metal, then you're also going to see a Roman numeral in parentheses in the name. And you have to remember that that Roman numeral tells you explicitly what the charge on the metal ion is. So let's do an example. Write the formula for iron three chloride. Okay. Really, this is the same as an example of writing the formula based on knowing what the two ions are, because it does, it tells you what the two ions are. You just have to recognize uh, what their symbols are from the name. Okay. So you have to remember that iron three means the symbol for iron is Fe, and the Roman numeral three indicates a plus three charge. Chloride, you have to remember, means Cl with a negative charge, and since Cl is in group 7A or 17, it really only needs one more electron to get to eight, and so chloride has a minus one charge. So the charge in the metal comes from the Roman numeral. The charge in the non-metal comes from the position on the periodic table. Now that we know the ions that we're dealing with, we have to figure out how they balance, okay? And so this just sort of says the charge of three plus is balanced by three Cl minus ions, and one times the three plus, one three plus ion plus three minus one ions gives you zero. Sure, that's fine. Uh, but if you wanna look at it a little bit uh, more concretely, you can start to draw out the ions, right? So we have a Fe three plus, and we have Cl minus. Okay, if you write down one of each, you can clearly see that there's more positive charge than negative charge. And so we should add another negative charge to see if we can balance it out. Adding one more negative charge still doesn't quite do it. We still have too much positive charge. And so we can add another negative charge in the form of a third chloride ion. And at that point, we can see that the plus three from the metal is balanced by the minus three from the three distinct chloride ions. Okay. So what we really have is a single iron ion, plus three ion, and three chloride ions. And so we can put that directly into the name here with iron chloride. It's FeCl3. This three means there's three ions. Remember, again, the three does not really have to do with the charge anywhere. It happens to be the charge in iron in this case, but that's not always gonna be the case. You should not try to think of this subscript as the charge or, or indicating the charge directly. It can be obtained from the charge, but you have to do a little bit of arithmetic to get there. In this case, you have to recognize that the three chlorides balance the single iron, and that's why you need three here. So, how do we write the chemical formulas for the following compounds? We have nickel two sulfide, zinc two chloride, and iron three oxide.
Well, for each one, we have to identify the cation and the anion. Right? So for each of these metal ions that's written first in the name, we're given a Roman numeral. And so that clearly tells us that that's the charge in the ion. So the symbol for nickel is Ni, and the Roman numeral 2 tells us that we're dealing with Ni2+. For zinc 2, the symbol for zinc is Zn, and the 2 in Roman numerals tells us again we're dealing with zinc 2+. For iron 3, the symbol for iron is Fe, and the 3 in the Roman numerals indicates a 3 plus charge. Okay. So those are the cations. For the anions, we again need to look at the periodic table. Sulfur is in group 6A, or 16, which means it has six valence electrons, and so it wants to get two more to achieve an octet. So once it's gotten two extra electrons, it's going to have a minus two charge. So sulfide is S2 minus. Chloride is in group 7A, and so it only needs one more to become Cl minus, and that has a stable octet. Oxygen is in the same group as sulfur, and so we can tell right away that it has the same charge as the sulfur ion. It's O2 minus for oxide. Then we look at how to balance them, right? So again, here with nickel 2 sulfide, nickel has a plus 2 charge and sulfur has a minus 2 charge. So if the charges on your two ions are equal and opposite, then it's very, very simple. Right? It's just one of each. If they're not equal, then you have to play around a little bit. Okay? Here we have a zinc 2 plus and we have a chloride. Right? One of each gives us too much positive charge, but I can just simply add another chloride to get two chlorides, like it says, and that will be charge balanced. For the last one, we have iron 3 plus, Fe3 plus, and here we have oxygen, which is O2 minus. Now this one's going to be a little bit tricky, because at first we have too much positive charge, right? Fe3 plus is bigger than O2 minus. But if we add another negative charge to balance that out, we're going to find that now we have too much negative charge, right? Minus 2 minus 2 is a minus 4 charge. And so plus 3 minus 4 gives you a negative charge. So now we need to add another positive charge, right? But that's also going to unbalance us back in the other direction. Now we have plus 6 from the irons and only minus 4 from the oxygens. Right? But we can add one more oxygen to make it minus 6 from the oxygens and plus 6 from the irons. And so we see that two iron atoms are balanced by three oxide ions. Once you know how many of each ion you need, it's a simple matter to write the formula. One nickel ion and one sulfide ion means NIS. One zinc ion and two chloride ions means ZnCl2. Two iron ions and three oxi oxide ions means Fe2O3. So again, I just want to look at this last one for a second to see the, the shortcut that we could have taken, right? You have Fe3 plus is the ion and O2 minus is the anion. Excuse me, Fe3 plus is the cation and O2 minus is the anion. So you can take the charge on the metal and bring it to the nonmetal, and the charge on the nonmetal and bring it to the metal, and you end up with Fe2O3. Okay? So again, this shortcut does work sometimes, but you just have to be very careful in using it, because sometimes you need to reduce the whole number ratio still.